Good morning, Foothills. It's great to see all of you here today. For everyone joining us online, we're happy to have you here as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, I want to start off with a couple of quick announcements for you. On February 7th, so I believe that's two weeks from today, because the Super Bowl's two weeks from today, and it's the same day as the Super Bowl. That's, uh, that's how I remember it, at least. We are doing a group link event here at the church. We are going to have, if you're looking to join a small group, you're looking to get more plugged in or become more part of the community by being a part of a small group, we're going to have an event to try to plug you in, help you get connected to other people at the church, and hopefully join a small group that you can be a part of going forward. That'll be February 7th. It says on the note card, we will get you home with plenty of time for the Super Bowl. So they've got their priorities in check. They're all ready to go for it. And so it sounds like a great event to me. Also, uh, after second service, we're going to be having a celebration for Pastor Peak and his wife, Kim, for their 25 years of being part of our community and part of Foothills. Yeah. And so that's going to be after second service. Uh, we'll be here at the church. It will also be broadcast. So if you're watching online, you're streaming, and you want to be a part of that, you still can be because it will also be broadcast for us. Um, let's jump in to talking about our series and what we're talking about for this series, which is Seven Rules for Life. We have been talking about the different rules that Paul lays down in Galatians. In this book, in this letter to the church in Galatia, Paul attempts to tell, talk to them about the rules that they are trying to follow, the rules that other people are trying to enforce on them, and how those work in conjunction with Christ, with who he is and what he has done for us. We saw in week one, uh, Pastor Peak, he talked about our purpose in life and how we must find our purpose in life to have a life that's full of meaning, a full of joy, and full of fulfillment. If we want to be able to have those things in our life, we must find our purpose, and our purpose is in Christ. In week two, Pastor Harv got up, and he talked about what forms us and what forms our lives, what changes us and influences us as human beings. He talked about how we have a choice to make. We can either choose to be formed by this world, by conforming to it, by conforming to its desires, by conforming to what it desires for us, and by listening to it, or we can choose to be formed by God. We can choose to be influenced and changed by God and his path for us and his plan for us. And the rule is, unsurprisingly, that God's way works out a whole lot better. And then last week, Pastor Pete got up again, and he talked about the rule of non-contradiction. And he talked about how our life must be built on truth, but not just like facts, not just like something that's scientific, but the ultimate truth of what this world really is, who we really are as human beings, what our purpose is in life, those truths. And we have to build our life on those truths if we want to be able to build our life on a firm foundation. And the law of non-contradiction came in there because we as people oftentimes will believe things that contradict. This world tells us that you can live however you want. You can have your own personal truth. You can believe whatever you want. You can act however you want. And in that way, you will be able to find yourself, whatever that really means. But that oftentimes can contradict with who we really are as people. Uh, an example I was thinking of when, when he talked about this and gave this sermon last week was we have some friends who have a young two-year-old son who's super cute and a ton of fun, and he's the cutest little guy in the world. But they, every single day, keep him to a same routine. They put him to bed at the same night every single night. And because of that, he actually gets tired at that time every single night. But what if they desired for that routine and they desired for him to get tired at the same time every single night and be ready for bed at the same time every single night, but they didn't use that routine. One night, they decided to eat dinner a little bit late and stay up. One night, they decided to watch a movie. One night, they decided they were really tired, so they were going to go to bed early. Well, there would be no routine anymore. That would contradict what their desire was to do, and then there wouldn't be a routine. Their son wouldn't be tired at the same night every night, and we as people often live in contradiction. And when we don't build our lives on a, a truth, we will have behaviors and beliefs that contradict each other. And when we do that, our foundation starts to crumble. It starts to crack. It causes us pain and it causes us harm. 
And so that's why last week we talked about the law of non-contradiction and why it's so important when we think about the truth and when we think about the rules that we follow. Today, though, we're going to talk about rule four, which includes a little bit of the law of non-contradiction that we talked about last week, but it pushes beyond it into a choice that we as humans make for ourselves. God has given us the ability to make this choice. He's given us the power and he's given us the sovereignty to make this choice. But the question is, what is this choice and what are we going to make when we come to this choice? Well, our rule for today is you can only be justified by Jesus Christ. Now, if you totally understand what that means and you are ready to go on it and you're feeling fine, that is awesome. Please pull out some paper, take some notes on my preaching, take some notes on my outfit, which you should send to my wife because she will know what to do with them and I will not. If you're not sure exactly what that means, if you're not sure exactly what I mean when I'm saying you can only be justified by Jesus Christ, then that's great because we've got about 25 minutes to talk about that. We are going to be in Galatians chapter 3, as the host said today. Uh, so if you want to follow along in your Bible, you can. The words will also be up on the screen. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul opens up this letters to the, this part of the chapter, or this part of the book of Galatians. He's coming in a little bit hot. Paul says, you foolish Galatians. And then there's an exclamation point. So I have a feeling he's coming in really hot on them. He's like, you guys have made a very, very big mistake. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portray portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you really experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? In verse 5, so again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? Paul is introducing a choice here. Paul is introducing the two different paths that the Galatians are kind of tiptoeing between. I don't know if you remember that uh, poem by Robert Frost with the, the road less taken. He talks about the two paths in a wood. They diverge, and he's like, I took the, load the road less traveled. And the Galatians are like, well, we're going to go this one, and we're going to jump to this one and jump to this one. They're trying to do both paths. And Paul is calling them out on it. Paul is saying, no, you cannot do that. You cannot live that way. You are being foolish. And in verse 5 is when he focuses on the paths and he focuses on the choice. Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? See, we as Christians know, and when Paul went to Galatia, the church in Galatia, he taught them that you are justified, you are redeemed, you are loved because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, his crucifixion on the cross. But we have this really nasty habit as humans where we start to go from believing in Jesus and knowing that he is what brings us grace and love and truth and being like, well, what if I followed the rules better? And that's why he's asking, how did God give you his spirit? How did he work miracles among you? And he's saying, was it by you following these rules? Was it by you following the law? Because that's where the Galatians have turned to. We've talked in the last few weeks about how there was this group. Paul would go and he would plant a church. And then behind him would come these guys who were called the Judaizers. Paul would go and he would preach the gospel, and then once he left to go plant another church, these guys, the Judaizers, would come in and be like, okay, so Paul told you all this stuff, but let's tell you some more. You need to follow the rules of Judaism, which are some pretty rough rules. No pork, that's no bacon. That's a pretty rough one. Um, also, I learned this part of the dietary restrictions uh, on, on the Jewish people. Um, you can't have dairy and meat together, which means no cheeseburgers. You can either have cheese or a burger. You can't have both, which I'm like, man. So if, if you put a bacon cheeseburger in front of a Jewish guy, he's going to have a rough time, <laughs> really rough time. 
But these guys were coming behind Paul and saying, this is what you need. You have to follow this law. And the, the people in Galatia were like, but, but Paul didn't say that. And they're like, well, Paul doesn't know everything. And now we see Paul writing this letter saying, these guys, this is what these guys are telling you, and it's wrong. So we see now that the people of Galatia are caught in this choice. They can either choose to live by faith in Christ, be justified and redeemed and loved by their faith in Christ, or by trying to follow the law that God gave the Jewish people in the Old Testament. Which one is it? Well, Paul is going to talk about the difference in these paths and the difference in these decisions. When we continue on and we go to verse 6, he says, So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Notice how Abraham believed God, and that's what was credited to him as righteousness, not following rules or a law. In verse 7, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And verse 10 is really important. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of law. And when Paul, this is in quotations because Paul is quoting the Old Testament. When God gave the people of Israel the law, he said, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything. So the old law is saying you are cursed if you do not follow this. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. Again, quotes because Paul is quoting the Old Testament. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Let's go back to verse 10 to talk about what happens when we try to justify ourselves by our adherence to rules, by the law that we hold dear and the law that we use. What does it say in verse 10? For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. If you follow the path of trying to follow the rules and use those to justify yourself as a good person, as a human who is following Christ, as someone who is filled with Christ's love and his spirit, you will be under a curse. Why is this? The reason why is because as the law in the Old Testament says, if you do not follow this law to the letter, you are under a curse. So the own law that these people were talking about, the rules that these people were talking about that you need to follow, it itself says you are cursed because you have not followed it. So that's not a great start. But what does it mean, this curse that it talks about? If we try to live our life by rules, if we try to live our life just by following the rules and adhering to rules, what does this look like, and what is this curse that it's talking about? Well, let's start with the rules. If we're going to try to live our life based on rules, based on laws, and that's how we're going to be justified before God, well, first off, we need to find out what rules are there. And we see this through all of our history as a species, is groups of people coming together and making laws and making rules. And it doesn't usually work out very well. Up until the mid-1800s, slavery was legal, which, I mean, according to the law, it was okay, but I don't think that made it right. We, we had slavery, even in our own country. We had the Civil Rights Act, wasn't passed till the mid-60s. So even after the Civil War and before the Civil Rights Act, there was 100 years where racism was not only legal, it was enforced by the law. The Jim Crow law in the South was not like, oh, if you want to be a racist, you can. It said, no, you will be a racist. The law was that African Americans and white people had to eat in different areas. That was not a decision by a restaurant owner. Now, this doesn't mean that they did not endorse the law, but it was literally the law that they had to be segregated. Did that make it right? Did that make it okay? Were the good people the ones who followed that rule to the letter and say, well, we need to, uh, we need to, we need to 
copy of your heritage so we can see exactly where you've fallen and exactly where you could sit, which I did not realize this till recently. They actually did, and they had names for people who were different percents of colored, as they would call it. They would say, oh, well, this person is one-eighth African-American and seven-eighths white, so they fall in this distinction. That's terrible, and that was the law. So are we going to look for the law to justify us? If we're making the law up, I think we can see and we know it's pretty wrong. The law in general may be good. It may help us. It may help us come together as a society sometimes. But if we're going to count on man's law, it is a failure. It is flawed. It is wrong. So maybe we can say, well, but we have the law. We have the law from the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a book of rules. We can use the book of rules and then we'll have the right rules and then we just have to enforce them. And that's great because then you just end up judging every person. And I'm sure that everybody out there who's married or has a friend or knows people or is in a family knows that the best way to build intimacy and grace is just to constantly judge other people. It works out so, so well. You know, it's like, well... Let's see, today you broke this rule and you didn't do this one. Oh, and you messed up this one down here. And this one's only a footnote, but you still technically like half broke it, so we're going to go that. That is not the way to have a relationship. Look at our culture today. Look at our country and what's happening. We have these different groups vying for control of what the laws are, and then they enforce and judge others based on how well those others follow their rules. And I will ask you a question. How is that going in terms of unification? I don't think it's going very well. All I have to do is turn on the news, and within 30 seconds, I'm like, oh, not going good today either. When we just try to live by enforcing the law, it leads to judgment. It leads to us becoming judges of every other person and their actions and their behaviors and their beliefs. And then once we start to judge others, we separate from them. Oh, well, I like that person, but they said something that I think is really wrong, so I can't talk to them anymore. So that's friendship gone. Oh, I was having a great time with this person, but then they decided to do this while we were out. Can't hang out with them anymore. And pretty soon, you're either all alone or you're only with people who are also judging. Neither of those are great spots to be. They are separation. They lead to separation and segregation of yourself from others. So that's what happens if we follow that way. That's what happens if we follow the path of trying to justify ourselves by following the law. There is another option, though. And this option is what Paul starts to present in verse 15. He says, Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. Scriptures does not say, does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. And verse 18, for if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God is in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Justification, rule four, you can only be justified by Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that we as humans have a God-sized hole in our heart. We are looking for a relationship with our creator. That is part of our purpose. That is part of who we are and what will bring us to him. Is it following the rules? Is it following a law? No. And Paul brings up a couple of great points why it's not. First off, God promised it to Abraham in a covenant. That doesn't sound like a law. That doesn't sound like a rule. Second off, the law came 430 years later. So it's kind of hard if God promised us something and then 430 years gave us the law that that thing 430 years after the promise is what will justify you. That doesn't make much sense. But no, verse 18, for the inheritance or our justification depends on, if it depends on the law, it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. See, God promised us this inheritance. God promised us this justification. 
And what was that justification? It was Abraham's seed. It was Abraham's bloodline. And who was born of Abraham's bloodline but Jesus Christ? See, when you read the book of Genesis, it may be the creation of the world. It may be all these things that happened thousands of years before Christ was born. It's still about Jesus. It's still about who he is. It's still about God's promises to us. And here in verse 18, Paul tells us that God in his grace promised us justification. He promised us redemption. And that promise was fulfilled through Abraham in the person of Jesus Christ. That is where our justification comes from. And why is this so important? Why is it so important to choose this path? Why is it so important to choose to be justified through our faith in Christ instead of our adherence to the law? Paul tells us, he goes down a couple verses, and in verse 26, he starts off and he says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Again, this promise that God gave to Abraham is what gives us our justification, and it makes us children of God through our faith in it. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, when we hold up the law as our justification, the focus becomes the law. The focus becomes how we follow it. The focus becomes what the law is. We become judgmental. We push others away through our judging of them and how they're not following it the way I think it needs to be followed. Or they keep making mistakes and messing up, which we all keep making mistakes and messing up. So that's a really rough way to go. But when we focus on the promise of Christ Jesus, when we focus on our faith in him, what what happens then? We are unified in that promise. Think of a beautiful orchestra that can play an amazing piece of music. They have one goal. They are unified in that goal. It does not matter what color the people are in the orchestra are, how diverse it is in terms of that. It does not matter if there are males or females in the orchestra. It does not matter where they come from, if they are from different parts of the world or different cultures. What matters is that they are part of one goal and they come together and they unify to make a beautiful symphony. When we are unified in Christ, when we focus on Christ as our justification, then instead of judgment and the law coming through the, to the forefront, Christ comes to the forefront. And what is Christ? What is his spirit? It's grace. It's truth. It's love. It's peace. It's joy. That unifies us. It brings us together. When we're focused on the law, if someone in our community messes up, all we can think about is how they deviated from the law. But if we put our justification in our faith in Christ, when someone messes up, it's like, well, yeah, I've messed up too. And Jesus gave me grace, and Jesus has given them grace. That's unifying. That is what brings us together. That is what brings us to a place of love and peace and allows us to look past all of these smaller details of who we are because we recognize that the number one thing that we are is children of God. And in that, we are unified past all barriers that the world puts on us. We are unified beyond anything that this world tries to define us as because we know that first and foremost, we are defined by our faith in Christ Jesus and nothing else else. So like I said at the beginning, God gives us a choice. God gives us sovereignty. We are allowed to choose. And the choice that we get to make is how will we be justified? How will you be justified? Will you be justified by the law, by which law you hold to be the correct one, and by how well you follow it? Or will you be justified in your faith in Christ Jesus and his sacrifice, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. 
in the world we live in, justification by the law is so, so tempting. But it's tempting because we have been lied to about morality and truth and the law. Any law of man is flawed. We all know this. We all look around and see the injustice that is endorsed almost by the authorities. The Human Rights Commission for the UN received a letter signed by 22 different countries to condemn the Chinese government for holding a million Muslims in concentration camps. It then received a follow-up letter signed by 50 countries that wanted to endorse China's great progress in the area of human rights. <laughs> the Human Rights Council issued no condemnation, and now for the next cycle, the Chinese government has a seat on its board. If you're going to look to man's law, I've got some bad news for you. It's flawed. It will fail. It is never authentically just. Following it and trying to judge others based on it just leads to judgment. It just leads to you becoming the judge and you deciding what is good and what is bad. And you're also always good, which is kind of nice. <laughs> That's not the way to go. It's tempting. It's what our world wants you to pick. But we know from the words of Paul and from the sacrifice of Jesus and from the words of God that he has given us that we can only be justified by Jesus Christ. That's why that's rule four. Because when we are justified by Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in him, when we live our lives by our faith in his crucifixion and our faith in his sacrifice and most importantly, our faith in his resurrection, we are affirmed as people because we know that we are flawed. We know that we desire to judge others. We know that we have deviated from the law and others have deviated from the law. We know that we've all messed up, but we also know that the Son of God came down to earth to justify us because of his love for us. What could be more affirming as a human being than the fact that the God who created both the law and you came down to rescue you from it, came down to say, I love you so much that you matter to me that I will die on a cross for you. That is why we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That is why we put our faith in his sacrifice, and that is why we know that we are justified through him. Because nothing else has the grace and the love and the affirmation that you as a human being have been given by God and what he did for you. We can try to do it ourselves. We can try to live a good life and be a good person and try to figure out for ourselves what that means. You'll end up in contradiction. You'll end up in guilt and shame because you know that you're messing up just as much as everybody else. Or you can live your life by faith. You can live your life by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself up for you. Don't live by the rules anymore. Don't live by the law or being a good person or a bad person. Live by your faith in the Son of God. We'll let Rachel close us out. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells the great crowds that followed him, On judgment day, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Do you know Jesus? Does he know you? Or are you relying on works to save you? If you want to know Jesus or know him more, please let us help you. Download our booklet, How to Connect to Jesus. Text FH Baptism or FH Prayer to 97000. Go to foothills.org forward slash groups and enter into a community of believers pursuing Jesus. Or download the FH app and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss an opportunity to grow in your faith with Foothills. For those at home, thank you for tuning in. Please go through the discussion questions and take time to pray over what you heard today. If you are on campus, please stand for a closing blessing.